welcome to module 6 of International Criminal Justice. I am Professor Rashmi Raman and I will be taking you through this module titled Creation of the Ad Hoc International Criminal Tribunals. The Learning Outcomes In this module, you will study about the establishment of ad hoc criminal tribunals. You will also learn about the legality of such tribunals. This module also touches upon institutional mechanism of the International Criminal Court and its role in the creation and development of ad hoc tribunals. The UN has in the past established many ad hoc tribunals for prosecuting specific criminals, primarily through resolutions in the Security Council. The Security Council has established two ad hoc tribunals, the ICTR and the ICTY. The UN has shown an interest and involvement in various establishments like the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the SCSL, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, that is the ECCC, and other similar judicial establishments. Apart from transitional justice and the rule of law as an important aspect to the UN, it is most likely that the International Criminal Court will handle situations arising in the future. The main purpose for the establishment of an ad hoc international tribunal is for the prosecution of persons most responsible for serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in different jurisdictions. The ICTY and the ICTR statutes have incorporated modes of liability that are recognized under customary international law. It is noteworthy that the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court departed from the law and jurisprudence on modes of liability established by the ICTY and the ICTR. In particular, the International Criminal Court does not recognize joint criminal enterprise per se. Rather, the Rome Statute has incorporated a different form of common purpose liability called co-perpetration. Legality of the Ad Hoc Tribunals The legality of creating an international tribunal through the Security Council rather than through a multilateral treaty or other mechanisms has been challenged by many state and non-state actors. It is clear from the text of Article 39, Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations that the Security Council plays a pivotal role and exercises a very wide discretion. The Security Council is an organ of international organization established by a treaty which serves as a constitutional framework for that organization, that is the United Nations. Once the Security Council determines that a particular situation poses a threat to the peace or an act of aggression, it enjoys a wide margin of discretion on choosing the course of action. It can either continue in spite of its determination to act via recommendations as if it were still within Chapter 6, that is the Pacific Settlement of Disputes, or it can exercise its exceptional powers under Chapter 7. In the words of Article 39, it would then decide what measures shall be taken in accordance with Articles 41 and 42 
to maintain or restore international peace and security. We will now look at some of the most important past ad hoc tribunals. The first situation, Yugoslavia. Established by Security Council Resolution on May the 25th, 1993, the ICTY took to upon itself the responsibility of trying individuals responsible for acts that it listed as crimes, including rape, enslavement, torture and murder. Its vision was to bring lasting peace to Yugoslavia by deterring future crimes. It felt that punishment would be positive deterrent. It ended up charging over 160 per persons. Situated in The Hague, the tribunal consists of three organs, the chambers, the prosecutors and a registrar. Situation 2. Rwanda. The ICTR was established in November 1994 and was the first tribunal to try the crime of genocide. It was also the first to interpret the definition of genocide set out in the 1948 Geneva Convention. Furthermore, it, is inter it's, it interestingly extended its subject matter over the fourth estate by holding media as an instigator of crime. It had provisions in place to try media people who broadcast material and content to stoke public hatred against one section of society to commit acts of genocide. Its last attempt was in the case of Ingira Batware. There have been other attempts by the United Nations to develop ad hoc international criminal tribunals. In the cases of Cambodia and Sierra Leone, the tribunals established were not purely ad hoc in nature. In Cambodia, the UN reached out to the royal government of Cambodia in 1997 to try the perpetrators of the Khmer Rouge. In 2003, the UN and the royal government of Cambodia agreed to set up the ECCC under domestic laws of Cambodia with assistance from the UN. The agreement allowed the UN and Cambodia to both appoint judges. This tribunal did not have the power to hand out a death penalty. It also entitled any accused to a Cambodian or international attorney. The ECCC was designed to execute a specific mandate and cease to operate once the mandate is complete. In Sierra Leone, the government sought the United Nations assistance to set up a trial. The Security Council did not exercise its powers to set up a tribunal via a resolution. Instead, it requested the Secretary General to proceed with the negotiation of an agreement with the government of Sierra Leone. The negotiation fructified in an independent special court. This was strangely a product of a bilateral treaty. The special court for Sierra Leone was born on January 16, 2002. The ECCC and the SCSL are terms as, termed as mixed tribunals. They can be contrasted with ad hoc tribunals primarily in the ways in which they were brought into existence. The mixed tribunals were a product of some form of agreement of a sovereign state and the UN, while the ad hoc tribunals were a product of the Security Council resolutions. This goes a long way to tell you about the powers and jurisdiction of tribunals. What about a permanent international criminal court? In Resolution 260 of 9th December 1948, the General Assembly, quote, recognizing that all periods, at all periods of history, 
genocide has inflicted great losses on humanity and being convinced that in order to liberate mankind from such an odious scourge, international cooperation is required, close quote, adopted the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Article 1 of that convention characterizes genocide as a crime under international law. And Article 6 provides that persons charged with genocide shall be tried by a competent tribunal of the state in which the territory of which the act was committed or by such international penal tribunal as may have jurisdiction. In the same resolution, the General Assembly also invited the International Law Commission to study the desirability and possibility of establishing an international judicial organ for the trial of persons charged with genocide. Following the Commission's conclusion that the establishment of an international court to try persons charged with genocide or other crimes of similar gravity was both desirable and possible, the General Assembly established a committee to prepare proposals relating to the establishment of such a court. That committee prepared a draft statute in 1951 and a revised statute in 1953. The General Assembly, however, decided to postpone consideration of the draft statute pending the adoption of a definition of the crime of aggression. Since at that time, the question of the establishment of an international court has been considered periodically. After the establishment of the ICTY, the International Law Commission successfully completed its work on the draft statute for an international criminal court. And in 1994, the ILC submitted that draft to the General Assembly. To consider major substantive issues arising from that draft statute, the General Assembly established an ad hoc committee on the establishment of an international criminal court. This committee met twice in 1995. An international criminal court has been called the missing link in the international legal system. The International Court of Justice at The Hague handles only cases between states, not individuals. Without an international criminal court for dealing with individual responsibility as an enforcement mechanism, acts of genocide and egregious violations of human rights often go unpunished. In the last 50 years, there have been many instances of crimes against humanity and war crimes for which no individuals have been able to be held criminally accountable. The ICC was a vision to fill the gaps with respect to ad hoc tribunals. The establishment of an ad hoc tribunal immediately raises the question of selective justice. A permanent court could operate in a more consistent way. Reference has been made to what is known as tribunal fatigue. The delays inherent in setting up an ad hoc tribunal can have several consequences. Crucial evidence can deteriorate or be destroyed. Perpetrators can escape or disappear and witnesses can relocate or even be intimidated. Investigation becomes increasingly expensive and the tremendous expense of ad hoc tribunals may soften the political will required to make them mandatory. Ad hoc tribunals are subject to limits of time and place. In the last year alone, 
thousands of refugees from the ethnic conflict in Rwanda have been murdered even 20 years after the conflict. But the mandate of that tribunal is limited to events that occurred in 1994 and 95. Crimes committed since that time are not covered. The dream of the ICC has been the following. To achieve justice for all, to end impunity, to help end conflicts anywhere in the world, to take action when national criminal justice institutions are unwilling or unable to act, and finally, to deter war crimes. In conclusion, the word ad hoc had been an adjective that draws considerable flack from a number of critiques who do not support the concept of selective justice. True to its nature, these tribunals are set up for a specific set of crimes limited by geography, time, and the will and interest of the international community and the United Nations to try and bring justice to the victims of injustice. Nonetheless, they may serve as a pathway to a more permanent structure that would be seated above the sovereignty of the states to try crimes of the most heinous nature. While this remains a distant dream for now, ad hoc and to some extent mixed tribunals seem to deliver justice that would satisfy the collective conscience of the international community. Thank you.